please welcome the Dr. Harry Moore. Ah, thank you, Linda. I am really pleased to be here, happy to be here. I'm pleased that you are here, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I originally thought I would thank all these people, but I think they've been named, but I do appreciate it, Dr. Beck and Vice President Taylor, that the administration has supported SKD in language and literature and has allowed me to come here and uh, read some of my poems. I was frankly a bit surprised. Uh, my friends tend to be very loyal, and I appreciate that, but still, I was a bit surprised when my slender little chapbook came out and I was invited to be the featured speaker. And I thought, well, maybe Calhoun appreciates this is gratitude for that 34 years of service, all the papers I graded, the years in the classroom, the marathon committees, uh, the administrative duties that I took in large part because nobody else wanted to take that. Uh, but then I remembered. In two, January 2009, when I retired, Calhoun's enrollment almost immediately went up by 2,000. <laughs> so I take it as something like a delayed retirement bonus <laughs> that I am allowed to come and uh, read from my poems. Uh, coming to Calhoun is like coming home. It is coming home. Um, I'm wearing a new hat, the poet's hat, and uh, I do hope you find it goes with my outfit. Uh, one word of warning uh, before we launch into the poems, and that is that poets are notoriously unreliable when they talk about their poems. In the first place, they don't really understand where the poems come from. Uh, let me give you an example of a famous poet whom I admire greatly, Robert Frost, explaining how this happens, and you tell me how much light this sheds on it. A poem begins as a lump in the throat, a sense of wrong, a homesickness, a lovesickness. Well, that's all true, but uh, you know, we, we, we hardly can say, well, that clears that up and we can go on. <laughs> uh, you understand what happens, uh, most some of you will, when you put an ice cube on a hot stove surface. As it melts, it just skids all over the place. Frost said, like a piece of ice on a hot stove, the poem must ride on its own melting. Well, of course, that's a little poem about poetry. So about the only thing you can say about it is to write another poem about it. So they don't really understand what they're doing. Secondly, they forget. They don't remember the circumstances always of how this came into being and what I was thinking when I wrote that. And finally, if it's to their advantage and makes them look good, they will lie outright. <laughs> and, and poets are, are famous for that. Ultimately, though, the poems must stand on their own if they stand at all. No amount of explaining and discussing a recipe will redeem a bad pudding. <laughs> I'm going to launch in with that uh, and read a poem called Character Reference. Uh, it, it is focused on teaching, although the moment occurred actually in my office. My colleagues and I used to chuckle uh, that two weeks into a term, students wanted a letter of recommendation. <laughs> In most cases, uh, that was difficult because we didn't know enough about the students to write the letter in any meaningful way. And in a few other cases, unfortunately, we already knew too much. <laughs> uh, but this is about a case, an unlikely case, where a student came to me. I mean, it's based on that. It grows out of that. Uh, and instead of being amusing, as we were usually amused by this, it took a serious turn. And I discovered that I really knew this student in some pretty deep ways. Character reference. 
named for him whose trumpet wakes the dead. He stands before my desk, quiet, straight, far from the comforts of graphic design, speaking lowly through tightened lips, as if some secret might leap from open mouth. I was wondering, he says, if you might write a reference for me. His eyes shift to the side, as if a yes couldn't be hoped for straight on. With hair thin to his shoulders, above dark t-shirt and faded jeans, he might be 25 or 19. I've known him two months and seven papers on the summer fast track, watching him bend one hour, two, three, over neat printed scripts scratching out, adding, drawing lines, asking where the comma goes or how to spell advice. I've read of his parents, rural patient mother suffering all, and savvy father breaking motors down, smoking every day. Of the night, acid ate his compass, and he wandered dark streets till daylight of how the stepdaughter has carved a place in his caring as they scrub dishes and floors and talk of lies and truth, and of how her mother, the blonde with smooth skin and a spirit he hungers for, is far away for unknown time. I wonder why at midterm his desk, desk sits empty for days, thinking one more has slipped past cure. But then he's back, caught again, he says, detained unavoidably, ready now to write, pouring again till the building empties and I flee over sources, citations, reasons that resist like a stubborn child his efforts at order. In the end, the numbers give him a B. At the door he turns, eyes unsure, my case is Thursday. Is that too soon? I'll have it ready, I say. <clears throat> there are many kinds of poems, and um, if people say they don't like poetry, that's saying I don't like food because they don't care for turnip greens. Uh, my poems are of a, of a particular type, but many of them tend to focus on a moment in the past, a kind of freeze frame, and where there's a kind of excavation and recreation of that moment. I use the facts as long as they work, and then I start making up stuff uh, to build the moment uh, and try to get at uh, something that I sense that I want to keep. And that, that's part of the poem, and that's really my first point about poems. They save something from, from the ongoing current of time and experience. They salvage moments that would otherwise be lost. Pretty much during all my years of teaching, this interplay of past and present uh, was, was a strong element within me. As I looked out over a class, uh, playing and flitting in random ways that over against my memory of growing up and that sort of thing. Um, so the next poem I want to read is about that. It's not so much about a specific moment as a typical moment in front of a class. I love fall of the year. Um, I love the splendid colors, uh, this just wonderful orgy of death that blazes up. Uh, I love the odors, the, the fields, the harvests that are going on. Uh, I love football in fall. I don't hunt anymore, but that's a part of my memory, squirrel hunting, uh, the futile attempt to shoot doves while they were flying. Uh, <laughs> school beginning. From kindergarten through graduate school, people piling, now I have to say, into real and virtual classrooms. Uh, you know, just pooling all these hopes and dreams, the sense of possibility in a new beginning. 
Now the poem I'm about to read refers to Marlowe, that is uh, Christopher Marlowe, Shakespeare's contemporary. Uh, if any of you happen to see Shakespeare in love, uh, you know that he was pretty much the same age as Shakespeare and at some point uh, Shakespeare, I think in that movie, thinks he's killed him. Or, uh, but anyhow, he wrote uh, Dr. Faustus, the play about the scientist, not the scientist, but the learned doctor who sells his soul to the devil. Uh, rises, tries to rise higher than he should as a simple man, and he falls. He's an overreacher. Milton, of course, wrote Paradise Lost, as Dr. Cross uh, mentioned. It has the towering figure of Satan, you know, the archangel who aspires to be God and falls down. Milton said he wrote that poem to justify the ways of God to man. Not a very humble undertaking, uh, but that's what he was trying to do. Icarus from Greek mythology uh, is the son of Daedalus who made him the wax and eagle feather wings so that the two of them could fly out of the labyrinth and escape the monster, the Minotaur. He cautioned Icarus not to fly too high, as fathers do to their sons, but the son, of course, did. And the wax melted and the feathers fell out and he plummeted into the sea. And there are famous works of art by one of the Bruegels, I think one of them, of the plowman in the foreground and the sea in the background and the tiny splash. So Icarus rose too high and he fell. So we start in this poem with the season that I love and uh, fall takes on other connotations and denotations as we move through the poem. Shows the center play between past and present. How can I ask them, poised here between Marlowe and Milton, musing over Icarus tumbling seaward, if ever when they squeezed the cotton with their fingertips and pulled it from the bowl of an early morning, it was drenched with cold dew. Or if astride a loping mare bareback, they felt against their clenched thighs her rhythmic muscles and the jolt of hooves against the earth. How can I ask if when they sat in a porch swing on a summer night, and listen to the sharp, sudden call of a whippoorwill or the deep-throated bellow of a bullfrog in a neighboring pond. They also heard the drone of a laboring truck on a distant highway. How can I ask if they remember the smack of rich, sour crabapples, big as eggs on the tree they climbed every September till they had strained after and reached the last outermost fruit? Or if they remember leaping one day, 30 feet from an iron scaffold into the smooth waters of Gant's Mill Pond. How can they know God's ways or man's if they can't see the girl in the third row has brown and supple shoulders and when she leans forward to write, breasts that hang round and ripe as any fruit. <clears throat> can't do anything better with that poem. Just let it be an answer to the question, what are they thinking about while they are up front talking? <laughs> okay, I'm going to read uh, another poem that focuses an actual uh, moment a specific moment. Uh, I had the memory, of course, all these decades, the poem starts with, uh, but it got connected to a long 4th of July weekend. Oh, it's been eight or nine years ago now, I guess, at least, uh, since our family uh, went over to Doublehead and rented a cabin and just piled in and slept where we could, you know, and had one of those uh, family weekends. And I had a dream during that time. Uh, 
I probably should warn you that maybe of all the poems in this collection, this one cuts closest to the bone. And don't be alarmed if I pause. I'm just collecting myself. Uh, it's not that I've lost my voice or I'm going away. The poem is The Search. Once I hid from my father by the field where he plowed, heedless of his frantic calls. A mile we rode on the wagon down rutted roads to the farm he rented, where an eager four, I watched his strong, wiry form step away behind the mule-drawn scrape tossing dark soil to the tender corn, till he passed almost out of mind. On the return, he loomed larger, G and haw, riding the mild May air louder with each step, till in a burst of rattling chains and snorting mew, he made the turn and moved away once more. Kneeling among ripening plums and barbed blackberry vines, I swelled in childhood glee while he called my name, his voice raking the woods behind me where copperheads crawled in warming weather. Finally, la laughter gave me away, and with lingering frown he fed me pudding from the pasteboard box my mother packed with peas, fried chicken, and cornbread, before daylight took her to the mill where she worked. Drinking sweet tea from a jug where melting ice cubes clinked, we sealed our pact never again to hide. Day after day and the long fourth weekend by the river, my grandson sought his father by porch, grill, tree, pier, and boat clinging to his leg, running to greet him, reaching to be held, stopping, to, stopping his play to look with alarmed eyes, falling asleep finally in limp vigilance in his father's bed, fearing he would disappear to the distant factory, worlds away that kept him two days, three a week from the empty house. All night in my dream, with sleeping children and grandchildren scattered over two stories, I walked a bare headland by a dark sea, crying, Come back, come back, please come back. Knowing that, after 30 years, he would not return. Well, I almost made it, didn't I? <laughs> ah. um, okay, the next poem I want to read uh, also focuses on a moment, a way back for me, in a world that, that must seem really strange to most of you, certainly to you, you students. Uh, when I used to set in with the kids, they wanted to do this or that at a certain age or this much spent on them, I'd start saying, well, when I was growing up, you know, <laughs> we did this, we did that, gas was 23 cents a gallon and <laughs> all that. And uh, my wife would remind me that uh, that was another world. And uh, she might even have said another galaxy. Uh, but. It is, but I, I would like to think that the theme we're dealing with here is very uh, current and that you will uh, get that. We don't see our parents as people. You know, they're our parents. We need them. They're the people we ask when we want things and that sort of thing. And it's only later that we realize how tough this or that situation might have been for them. Uh, so this poem has to do uh, with uh, a mother who worked in a cotton mill and worked second shift, 
that is 3 to 11, at a cotton mill, oh, 35 miles from home. Leaving home quarter of two or so with the ride in the station wagon full of people that she rode with, getting off work at 11, coming home about midnight, and being a farmer's wife when she was at home not doing that. And uh, a moment when that gets to be more, really, than she can handle. But the poem, Taking Leave. I can't go on, she said, leaning on my father's shoulder. They stood by the hickory tree we'd cut, where he told me not to ride the cross-cut saw we pulled back and forth, laying up a store of wood for coming winter cold. I've got to have some rest, she said. She was out of season in our world, always gone before the school bus dropped us off at home on her job at Pepperell Mills, where she moved briskly around a large spooling machine, her flying hands tying up ends, exceeding all production goals. Then coming home at midnight while we slept, laying out socks, shirts, handkerchiefs, and quarters my brother and I found as we arose for school. She slept till eight, then washed loads of jeans, cooked roast, peas, cornbread, and ironed shirts for church. From Sunday night to Saturday, we moved like phantom lovers too far off to touch, drinking joy in the like the cold sweet tea she made if we came home from school one day to find her there. With surprise and wonder, we watched her walk down the hill where my brother's sled in summer sped on pine straw toward the spring below. Her blouse was white and sleeveless with a wide elastic belt, a narrow skirt that reached below the knee, white socks, and sandals with rubber soles, her hair drawn back into a bun, nothing loose or flaring when she dressed for work. Without a word, my father reached to hold her in sawdust by the stump. It'll be okay, he said. We'll make it fine. My brother held a limb he dragged, and I stood by the saw. For a long minute, we felt our world reshape itself, our rising joy tempered by this strangeness. Could she be taking leave to be with us? <clears throat> Poems save things then, experiences. You have to go back and work on them and <laughs> add things, rearrange things in terms of poetry. They salvage things from the past that you want to keep. And if it works, pass on to others. Poems also clarify and give order to experiences that are otherwise just turbulent. Robert Frost, after I made fun of him earlier for talking about the lump in the throat, uh, I will cite as a kind of authority here, said a poem begins in delight. It inclines to the impulse. It assumes a direction with the first line laid down. It runs a course of lucky events and ends in a clarification of life. Not necessarily a great clarification such as sex, S-E-C-T-S, groups, <laughs> and cults are founded on, but in a momentary stay against confusion. We live, if we're honest, pretty much in chaos. This demanding, that demanding, trying desperately to look like we've got it together, maybe help others keep theirs together. And we, we need these momentary clarifications, a momentary stay against confusion. Not as one of my students said once, 
a momentary state of confusion. <laughs> uh, the next poem I want to read uh, is about an experience, a moment. I guess I was maybe seven, something like that, with my father. He'd lost a foxhound that had gone off too far chasing the fox and had not found its way home. Uh, and it has to do with uh, uh, broadly race relations. I grew up in pre-civil rights, East Sem Central Alabama. Uh, there was, I think, respect and goodwill between African American people and uh, white or Caucasian people. But there was a strict set of uh, of, of systemic arrangement, uh, systemic rules uh, that I had little sense of. I just thought that's the way things were. Uh, we worked in the field side by side. Occasionally we might play ball together, but we didn't visit in one another's houses. 